translate in a head-to-head -head competition. Yeah, you know, uh, we're, we're going to be airing live the remarks from both Karen Taylor Robeson and Carrie Lake. Uh, they are vying to be the next governor uh, of Arizona, of course. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not sure if you've been speaking to some people who, you know, work for their campaigns or, or what have you, but how do they feel? We know um, that Karen Taylor Robeson has always trailed Lake, and it depends on what poll you look at, but some of them have been kind of all over the place. Uh, but you mentioned independence. Karen Taylor Robeson needed independence to come out for her and those undecideds. Do you think we'll see that? Well, she certainly is winning about independence two to one, according to our polling. So any additional independents that show up today benefit Robeson. On the other hand, what we haven't really seen a lot of is how many uh, rural Arizonans are voting today, which tend to benefit Lake. So what might likely happen is that they offset each other. What you should be looking for going into 8 o'clock is the early ballot drops. All 900,000 ballots should be dropped right around 8 p.m. And then what we'll see is that 100,000 plus Maricopa County and others Election Day voters will be counted later in the day. Um, if Robeson is up, in the early votes that are dropped at around 8 p.m., she has a chance of winning. If Lake is up, it's likely the race is over. Now, the thing to bear in mind is this. There are about 200,000 or so likely drop-offs. If you follow the trend from 2018 and 2020, which, which about 230 and 240,000 drop-offs, those are people who took their ballot to a polling place and dropped them in the box. I suspect those are a bit of the wild card right now. We're not quite sure how they'll trend. Um, in the 2020 general election, Biden started with a pretty sizable lead, and then it degraded over time because of those drop-offs. But in 2018, uh, McSally was in the lead in the Senate race, and then we saw a lot of those folks trend towards cinema, and that's how cinema won. So it's really about uh, a toss-up right now which way that might go. Yeah, of course, uh, and we've heard time and again, especially from Carrie Lake and her campaign, urging her supporters to vote on the day of in person. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of her ilk do not like, uh, you know, mail-in ballots or, or the, some of these absentee mail drop boxes. Uh, let's talk about, you know, geographically, the counties in play. Is it all going to come down to Maricopa County? You mentioned some of the rural Arizona counties. Could they be, you know, bellwethers for this as well? Well, here's the thing. I mean, about 65% of the vote will come out of Maricopa County. Another 20% or so will come out of Maricopa, or uh, come out of rural Arizona. 25, 15%, uh, pardon me, will come out of Pima for the Republican primary. So the issue is, where do these Maricopa County voters go? They make, make up about 65% of the vote. The most busy polling place today through the early afternoon was the Surprise City Hall. There's a high senior area there. It is a uh, high number of retirees in that community. And we saw Robeson polling really well in that area. And so that might be bode well for Robeson. On the other hand, the election folks that are concerned about the election and voted today likely benefit Lake because uh, they're concerned about the security of the election. And so it's, it's really like wh which one is going to dominate when we look at those early ballot returns. And those drop-offs, those might be undecided folks. They've, they can break either way. Um, what I do know is this. If Robeson does not have a lead going into the Election Day voters, if she doesn't have a lead with the early 900,000 or so folks who dropped off overall, which about 500,000 or so were Republicans, if she doesn't have a lead in that, in that section, she's going to really have a difficult time keeping up. All right, uh, Paul, so polls now have been closed for about 17 minutes. Uh, we just spoke to one of our reporters uh, outside one of those polling locations in Mesa, Arizona. If you're still in line uh, by 7 o'clock, you can stay in line, of course, uh, and vote. We're getting this tweet in as well uh, from the Pinal County government account. They say due to unprecedented demand for in-person ballots, Pinal County has experienced a ballot shortage in certain limited precincts. Pinal County is continuing to print additional ballots and distributing them to each affected precinct polling place. So these things happen during some of these elections. So I'll be interested to see, uh, especially about turnout as well, because we know primary voters are the most invested. Uh, they, they're not your typical general election voters. Um, right. You know, Paul, last question for you. Say Carrie Lake does get the nomination. Do all of her opponents, uh, and this has been pretty divisive, do they fall in line? Do they coalesce around her going into November? 
Most of them have indicated that they would, that they Republicans like that have been uh, proven in the past to be willing to uh, back the Republican nominee, saying that it's better than the general election nominee. I suspect they'll all turn to attacking Biden and, att and attaching uh, the, her opponent, Katie Hobbs, to Biden. I don't think it'll be a, more about uh, supporting Lake, but less about uh, uh, more about uh, attacking Biden and his policies. So I do suspect, yes, in that general case, I think most Republicans will line up against Lake. The challenge she's going to face is that unaffiliated voters aren't very keen on things like election fraud. And, and she's going to have a challenge appealing to those audiences, combined with some of the education funding issues, cameras in the classrooms, and some of those items. But I suspect the other races, the ones to watch, like the Senate race, when we see these results happening in other, in other parts of the country, in Missouri and in Michigan, I suspect in these crowded races, the Senate race, the Secretary of State's race, it's likely to be a big Trump factor in those races. What really is up for grabs right now is the gubernatorial head-to-head. -head. All right, uh, and we will watch it in the next couple of hours here. Paul Benz, thank you so much for this insight uh, and this expertise, uh, especially in these crucial Arizona races. We'll talk to you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay, so that was my conversation there with Paul Bentz earlier, and we have used him, and he has such great insight uh, into uh, so many of these key races in Arizona. Let's go back out live. This uh, is a live now look at Carrie Lake's watch party, also at Karen Taylor Robeson's watch party there. Karen Taylor Robeson, we have seen. She is in the room, uh, and so once uh, they step up to the podium, uh, if it's before 10 o'clock on the West Coast, we'll bring you those remarks live now we have been focused uh, on so many of these candidates especially in arizona in michigan in missouri and in washington state we're going to get a live report uh from washington state i believe in about the next uh five or ten minutes about some of the key races there but let's focus on the issues that voters care about especially this uh referendum this question that was put to kansas voters uh, on the ballot today uh, and we had been bringing you the news uh that kansas voters rejected a constitutional amendment that would have allowed the legislature to further restrict abortion access in the state. Now, this was the first time the issue of abortion has been put to voters in a state since Roe v. Wade was overturned in late June. So we're getting a statement in from Senator Roger Marshall. Uh, we're also getting in a statement from the White House. Let's read out the White House statement first from President Biden. He says, the Supreme Court's extreme decision to, to, to overturn Roe v. Wade put women's health and lives at risk. Tonight, the American people had something to say about it. Voters in Kansas turned out in record numbers to reject extreme efforts to amend the state constitution to take away a woman's right to choose and to open the door for a statewide ban. This vote makes clear what we know. The majority of Americans agree that women should have access to abortion and should have the right to make their own health care decisions. So the White House responding, it goes on to say, Congress should listen to the will of the American people and restore the protections of Roe as federal law. While that is the only way to secure a woman's right to choose, my administration will continue to take meaningful action to protect women's access to reproductive health care we will continue to act where we can to protect women's reproductive rights and access to care. And the American people must continue to use their voices to protect the right to women's health care, including abortion. Now, remember, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, passed a bill codifying a woman's right to choose. Uh, that is essentially going nowhere in the Senate, although the House wanted to get members on the record for that vote some weeks ago. So we're all, not only getting statements in from the White House on this, Republican Senator from Kansas, Roger Marshall, in a statement said, words could never express the sadness and the emotion myself and many Kansans are feeling after the value of them both amendment was not adopted. This is an enormous blow to efforts to protect the sanctity of life in Kansas. So uh, the abortion issue uh, is on the top of mind for many Kansans, but they rejected uh, this amendment to their state constitution uh, that would have banned the procedures, that would have restricted the procedure outright. Now, this dovetails with yet another state being sued by the Department of Justice today. That's Idaho. Over their restrictive abortion laws, Attorney General Merrick Garland held a press conference earlier today saying that the state's restrictive abortion law in Idaho uh, interferes with and contradicts 
federal law on abortion, especially when it comes to protecting the life of a mother who wants to seek an abortion. So uh, this is all very interesting tonight. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break, though. When we come back, we'll be getting more updates as well, talking about the incredible life and legacy uh, of the uh, famed sportscaster for the L.A. Dodgers, Vin Scully. We just got the news passing away at the age of 94. More on that in two minutes. Many, not only in Arizona, are following these. Okay, so let's get an update as well on this key race in the state of Michigan. This is the primary uh, on the GOP side for Michigan's third congressional district. Uh, and so there you can see incumbent Republican Peter Meyer trailing behind his Republican opponent, John Gibbs. And so I don't believe this race has been called yet. This is really neck and neck. 
Uh, so we don't know if this is going to be, you know, go to a, a recount, an automatic recount. We don't know if it has reached the threshold for that yet. And I'm not entirely sure about the particular uh, state laws in Michigan uh, to do just that. Now, you'll remember Peter Meyer uh, was one of those 10 House Republicans who bucked their party and voted in favor of Donald Trump's second impeachment trial to impeach uh, after the January 6th Capitol riot. And so that is why, uh, you know, members of the right wing of the party mounted this primary bid to get back at Meyer. Uh, and we've been talking to experts uh, and political reporters saying that this is really uh, out to get Peter Meyer a vendetta for his vote against then President Trump uh, as he only had so many days left in office after the January 6th Capitol riot. So that's a really interesting race that we're still watching in the state of Michigan. Of course, we already know what happened uh, for the GOP gubernatorial bid. Tudor Dixon is now the Republican nominee for governor there in Michigan. She'll be taking on incumbent Democrat Gretchen Whitmer in the fall. So uh, a female Republican and a female Democrat in a statewide governor's race. Uh, I cannot remember if that has ever happened in Michigan uh, or if that has ever happened ever. And hopefully we'll get some people smarter than I am to come on to say if that has ever happened before. That is going to be a very, very historic race. Uh, and so we're also following a lot of these races in Seattle as well. Beautiful live now look there in Seattle, Washington. Washington State seeing uh, a number of these key races that many are following. So we do have the matchup that is set uh, for the Senate race in the fall. Democrat Patty Murray, the senator who holds the seat right now, she won her primary and she'll take on Tiffany Smiley, the Republican uh, in the fall. Tiffany Smiley winning her primary uh, on the Republican side. Back out live to Seattle. Okay, we just wanted to show you that beautiful, gorgeous uh, Live Now look uh, in Seattle as we are following as well. Uh, key races in Washington state. Uh, we still don't have any updates yet uh, on some of these two congressional races that I'm interested in, uh, who um, are, are really similar ones to what Peter Meyer is facing in Michigan. Uh, two incumbent Republicans are being primaried by other Republicans in both the second and the third congressional districts in Washington state. That's uh, Jamie Herrera Butler. Uh, and also um, Dan Newhouse, I'm sorry, that's the 4th Congressional District with Newhouse. They were also Republicans who voted, uh, they were one of the 10 uh, to vote to impeach Donald Trump for a second time after the January 6th Capitol riot. And so many members of the uh, right-wing elements of the party uh, mounted a primary bid against them to oust them as kind of a vendetta uh, against with their vote uh, against former President Trump. Uh, to impeach him for his role on January the 6th. So we don't have really any numbers uh, on that just yet. If we do get some, 
we'll bring them to you here. All right, so we want to move on to uh, some of these other headlines uh, that we have been bringing to you on this very, very busy Tuesday night. Of course, we brought you the very, very sad news that the famed broadcaster, Vin Scully, has died at the age of 94. There you can see we have some kind of file video of him from over the years. He called Dodgers games for 67 years, back when they were the Brooklyn Dodgers, even before they moved to L.A., back in the late 1950s there. So right now we do want to play out for you some of those famous calls, some of what Vin Scully will be known for many, many years from now in baseball lore. Of course, the famous 88 World Series with Kirk Gibson, the famous record-breaking home run for Hank Aaron. Let's take a listen. High fly ball into right field. She is gone! In a year that has been so improbable, the impossible has happened. One ball and no strike. Aaron waiting. The outfield deep and straight away. Fastball is a high drive in the deep left center field. Buckner goes back to the fence. It is gone. Evie Brooks at first. Okay, so um, we're just kind of walking back through memory lane here, uh, seeing some of these famous calls uh, by Vin Scully. Of course, he lost his wife uh, earlier last year. He also lost uh, his very good friend and colleague, the former manager of the L.A. Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda, as well. So uh, 94, a ripe old age, a very, very long, a very incredible life. We want to talk about it even further. We're being joined in the newsroom uh, by Fox 10. Phoenix sports producer and reporter, kind of a, a master of all here, uh, Megan Plain. Megan, good to see you, uh, and welcome to Live Now. I believe this is the first time, but um, a very, very sad day in the world of professional sports, including Major League Baseball. Uh, and, you know, what are you hearing from, you know, social media reaction, people weighing in? Uh, I, I want to say this is probably not coming to a shock to many, but it's still sad nonetheless. Oh, yeah, it's certainly sad. You know, you mentioned the shock on social media. This is something where, you know, players from any team, front office people from any team, fans of any team, they're all chiming in and talking about, you know, just how sad they are at this news because when you look at Vince Scully, he is one of the greatest broadcasters, you know, to ever do it in Major League Baseball. He's got one of those voices that, you know, as soon as you hear it, you know, oh, okay, I know who it is. That's Vin. Um, you know, he was greatly admired by everyone in the game of baseball. He's someone who's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, something that very few sports broadcasters get to do when it comes to the game of Major League Baseball. So, yeah, on social media, lots of mourning going on right now. You know, also, Megan, I, I mean, for people who are just coming uh, to know Vin Scully now that he has passed and looking back on his life. Was he just a broadcaster? We know that iconic voice. Or did he play himself? You know, so many uh, of these famous uh, athletes who come on television in their uh, later careers, they were athletes themselves, and they were pretty remarkable in their own right. Mm -hmm, yeah, certainly. Um, it, you know, he is quite remarkable as well for, you know, someone who's been in the game that long like you had mentioned earlier he started off in brooklyn when the dodgers were there to make their way out to la with the team you know co covering the team calling games for more than 60 years he's certainly remarkable in his own right and he's a guy who you know with all the talent that he has and as well known as he is he's very humble about it as well you know his humility is you know one of the big characteristics about him that people like to point out when you ask him about or when you did ask him about you know his talent and what he brings to the game of baseball, he'd always remind you, you know what, I'm just here to 
tell the stories to you. I'm not the story. And he would always kind of pass that off when the guy's playing the game. So, you know, when you look at him and the humility that he brought as well, that, you know, really put him up on a pedestal even further for a lot of people in the game of baseball. You know, Megan, also, uh, I remember watching live and some of the clips uh, when he did call the last game, I think it was back in 2016, for the Dodgers uh, and the outpouring of emotions that he felt uh, as the entire Dodger Stadium stood up, applauded, gave that uh, very, very due ovation to him, tears in his eyes. It was really, um, you know, emotional moment. I think that was back in 2016, so he's been out of it for some time. Of course, he lost his wife last year. He lost his friend, Tommy Lasorda, last year. Uh, and so, um, you know, really a remarkable life uh, looking back. But like you were saying, uh, he was so humbled by the fans who made him who he was. Oh, yeah, I mean, certainly humble and it doesn't matter who it was in the game of baseball you know that could you know talk about just how great he truly was it could be you know the best in the game down to you know even just the fans and it, it didn't matter you know he would like i said constantly remind people that he is just there as kind of a conduit you know to bring people the game of baseball and today dodgers ceo and president he had talked a little bit about how sad that this loss is he mentioned that we lost an icon and that is certainly true. This is a guy who, you know, not just a generational talent, he's someone who spans many generations with his talent, whether it's someone who listened to him back when the Dodgers were still in Brooklyn or whether, you know, it's people who only recently kind of grew up on the game of baseball. I mean, all ages, everyone knows who Vin Scully is. So such a sad passing today. Definitely uh, multi-generational, kind of like you were alluding to. We're also uh, getting more and more reaction on, on Twitter as well. We read out the statement and the condolences put out by LeBron James uh, offering his thoughts on the passing of Vince Scully. Of course, LeBron James, uh, another L.A. icon as well. This coming on the heels as well, Megan, uh, of another sports icon we lost over the weekend, NBA legend Bill Russell at the age of 88. Do you have anything else? Last thoughts. Last thoughts. You know, let's just bring up some really interesting things about Vince Scully. You know, one of the things he's one of the youngest ever to broadcast a World Series game. That's pretty cool. He actually got his big break in broadcasting at a college football game. Vince, a guy who's called 19 no hitters. I mean, just the things that he's accomplished during his time. He's just so unforgettable. Um, you know, so like I said, an icon that we unfortunately lost today. Yeah, and Megan, we're just uh, going to be monitoring some of this reaction here as well there from Rich Eisen also from other Twitter accounts posting their favorite clips you know I was reading as well it wasn't only Major League Baseball he called NFL games he called PGA Tour uh, tournaments uh, as well uh, he you can see there college football games uh, and so uh, he was so versatile when it came to that but so many are going to be remembering the voice uh, you know not many in our business uh, the fans and the viewers can pick out a voice in a lineup. Uh, and of course, with Vince Scully, you definitely could. Megan Plain, thanks for joining us in the newsroom. We appreciate your uh, you know, insight into this as we're going to continue monitoring the reaction uh, on the death of Vince Scully just tonight. We'll be back in two minutes.
husband that they got in and you can have one of the others but we only got like 25 in this morning and we're having everybody come back and hopefully we'll get some more by three or four this afternoon but there's no guarantee and that is a story we have heard on repeat from multiple people all throughout the day. Now, according to some of the people that we spoke with, they said it was only Republican ballots. But again, Pinal County did not confirm this. Earlier, the county did say this, quote, due to unprecedented demand for in-person ballots, Pinal County has experienced a ballot shortage in certain limited precincts. Pinal County continues to print additional ballots and distribute them to each affected precinct polling location. Also, we do know this from the polling locations. Pinal County sharing that if you were in line by 7 o'clock today, physically in line by the minute the polls closed, you were still allowed to cast your ballot. But we will tell you, just about wrapping up that 9 o'clock hour uh, a little while ago, that is when we saw people outside here at the Jack Harmon Elementary School, one of the polling locations in Santan Valley. So we've seen a lot of issues uh, just throughout the nights, and it's definitely put everything on a complete delay here, Andrew. Yeah, uh, Marissa, give us a sense. I know this is very basic and generic, but, uh, you know, a lot of people outside of Arizona, they know Maricopa County. That's the big county. Uh, what cities comprise Pinell County? Give us a sense geographically, just briefly, if you could. So it's more just to the east of Maricopa County. We're talking about Apache Junction and uh. Gold Canyon and Santan. So these are some of the areas, and they are more heavily Republican counties, uh, more heavily Republican towns in the county. But again, uh, waiting on Pinal County to make a statement on this. They did say that tomorrow at about 1 o'clock, they will be doing a briefing on this at the courthouse in Florence to talk about all of the issues. They said this actually falls under the elections department and not under the county recorders. So we are going to wait and see what happens with that. Okay, Marissa, this is also garnering the attention of both the state Republican Party and the national Republican Party. They put out a joint statement uh, earlier tonight uh, on this very issue. I want to read it in part. They said, during Arizona's primary elections, the RNC and the Republican Party of Arizona's poll observer program documented and reported multiple failures by Pinal County's elections administrator, including 63,000 mail-in ballots delivered to the wrong voters, in multiple Republican heavy precinct locations running out of ballots. So it's not only the issues, at least according to the uh, statewide and national Republicans, of running out of ballots, it's ballots being delivered to the wrong people. Yeah. Yeah, there seems to be multiple issues. At this point, we've only just focused on the one we're currently talking about because there is so much to get into. Uh, we've been covering this, at least on Fox 10 Phoenix, for weeks now on the issues that they have been dealing with here in Pinal County. And it has been building, but I will say, Pinal County goes back to what they said is that it's been an unprecedented amount of voters coming out for this election, whether that be mail in ballots or drop offs or people showing up in person. So that's the message they keep sending us back to is that this is because of that unprecedented amount of voters coming out for this specific primary day. Yeah, it's so interesting, especially with primary elections, you really never know what turnout is going to be. They're very dislike general elections uh, in that respect. Marissa Sarbeck there live for us, so we appreciate your reporting. We'll talk to you again. Andrew, thanks. All right, uh, what uh, a night here in Arizona as we experience uh, and get some of this great reporting by Marissa there about some of the failures that the RNC uh, and the Republican Party in Arizona are citing that have happened in Pinal County. Uh, if we get any of the candidates to comment on this as well, we'll bring that to you here. Uh, back out live to some of these election night watch parties in Arizona. We just heard a speaker step up to the podium there at Karen Taylor Robeson's watch party. Uh, and I believe we still have the live look inside of Kerry Lake's watch party. We're going to update numbers for you when we come back. Also in the Senate race as well, about 60% of precincts reporting in both these races. We'll see you in two minutes.
<laughs> okay, as Kareem noted, uh, and you all obviously been tracking uh, the president's announcement yesterday that on the 30th of July, the United States undertook a precision counterterrorism operation in Kabul. They targeted and killed Al Qaeda's leader, Ayman al Zawahiri. Zawahiri was the world's most wanted terrorist. He was Osama bin Laden's deputy during the 9 11 attacks and became his successor in 2011, following bin Laden's death during a U.S. counterterrorism mission. Zawahiri continued to pose an active threat to U.S. persons, interests, and national security. As President Biden has consistently said, we will not allow Afghanistan to become a safe haven for terrorists who might bring harm to Americans, to the homeland. We met that commitment. This action demonstrates that without American forces on the ground in Afghanistan and in harm's way, we still remain able to identify and locate even the world's most wanted terrorist and then take the action to remove him from the battlefield. That is the definition, this mission, of when we talked a year ago of over-the-horizon counterterrorism capability. What we did this past weekend is a perfect, a clean example of what that capability looks like. Now on to uh, Taiwan. As you have all seen, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, arrived in Taiwan uh, earlier this morning, East Coast time. Uh, as we have said, the Speaker has the right to visit Taiwan. And a Speaker of the House has visited Taiwan before without incident, as have many members of Congress over the years, including this year. Now, this trip was the Speaker's decision, and Congress is an independent branch of government. You all know that. When we're obviously monitoring her travel, as we always do for members of Congress, and we've taken all appropriate measures to ensure the safety of her travel throughout the region. Let me be clear. The Speaker's visit is totally consistent with our long-standing One China policy. We've been very clear that nothing has changed about our One China policy, which is guided, of course, by the Taiwan Relations Act, three joint U.S. PRC communiques, and the six assurances. We've said that we oppose any unilateral changes to the status quo from either side. We've said we do not support Taiwan independence. And we've said, as I said again yesterday, that we expect cross-strait differences to be resolved by peaceful means. And we have communicated this directly to the PRC at the highest levels, including in last week's call between President Biden and President Xi, the National Security Advisor, Secretaries of State and Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, have also made this very clear to Beijing in a half a dozen recent high-level conversations. Now, we've seen a number of announcements from the PRC in just the last several hours that are, unfortunately, right in line with what we had anticipated and what we talked about yesterday. Now, there's no reason, as I said yesterday, for Beijing to turn this visit, uh, uh, which is consistent, with long-standing U.S. policy into some sort of crisis, or use it as a pretext to increase aggressiveness uh, and, and military activity in or around the Taiwan Strait, now or beyond her travel. And again, as I made clear yesterday, before the Speaker's travel was confirmed by her, China has positioned itself to take further steps. And we expect that they will continue to react over a longer-term horizon. I couldn't give you a date certain of what that horizon looks like, but we certainly would expect them to react even beyond her trip, including announcing additional uh, uh, large-scale live, live fire exercises. Of course, they've already started doing some of that today, flying across the median line. We've seen press reports of them doing that today and using economic coercion. It's exactly in line with the playbook that we anticipated and talked to you about yesterday. The United States will not and does not, will not seek and does not want a crisis. We are prepared to manage what Beijing chooses to do. At the same time, we will not engage in saber rattling. We will continue to operate in the seas and the skies of the Western Pacific as we have done for decades. We will continue to support Taiwan, defend a free and open Indo-Pacific, and seek to maintain communication with Beijing. We will keep doing what we are doing, which is supporting cross-strait peace and stability. And then just real quick, lastly, uh, uh, Kareem uh, uh, hinted to this at the top. Uh, the President welcomes today's announcement of an extension of the truce in the Yemen conflict. The truce in Yemen, of course, was a key agenda item during the President's visit to Saudi Arabia, where he met with the King and the Crown Prince. 
and with leaders from across the region. We're grateful for the leadership of Saudi Arabia throughout this truce process, as well as the Sultan, as well as for the Sultan and leaders uh, of Oman who have also played an important role throughout. Now, this truce is now going on five months, has brought a period of unprecedented calm in Yemen, saving thousands of lives and bringing tangible relief for countless Yemenis. Five months, which may not sound like a lot, but when you're talking about seven years of war and thousands and thousands of Yemeni lives, it counts for a lot. And now we have a chance to extend this another two months. So we urge the Yemeni parties to seize this opportunity to work constructively under UN auspices to reach an inclusive, comprehensive agreement that paves the way for a durable, Yemeni-led resolution to the conflict. Advancing the peace process is going to require courage and dedication from all sides. The United States will remain committed and engage in efforts to advance peace in Yemen and to bring relief to the Yemeni people. And with that, we'll take some questions. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, John, how concerned is the administration right now that the Afghanistan has become a safe haven for terrorists? I think if you were to ask some members of al-Qaeda, ask them how, how safe they feel in Afghanistan right now. Um, I think we proved uh, to a fair thee well this weekend that it isn't a safe haven and it isn't going to be going forward. What will the repercussions be for uh, the Taliban harboring al -Zawakri? I'm not going to telegraph uh, moves and decisions that we might make. I'm certainly not going to get ahead of anything at this point. Uh, I would just make uh, two points. One, uh, the strike itself shows how serious we are uh, about accountability. It shows how serious we are about defending our interests. And we're going to maintain, as I said at the outset, we're going to maintain this over-the-horizon capability. In fact, I'd go so far as to say we're going to continue to try to improve that capability going forward. Um, and number two, we've communicated very directly with Taliban leaders um, uh, our views of, of uh, their willingness at, at some level, of course, to, to harbor uh, Zawahiri and, uh, and his family. Um, and we have made it clear that not we believe, not we think, not we suppose, but we know that that's a violation of the Doha Agreement. So obviously, John, just to follow up on that, clearly this shows accountability for Zawahiri and for al-Qaeda, wherever they are, as yeah. you got them in Afghanistan, but it doesn't show accountability for what the Secretary of State described as a gross violation of the Doha Agreement. So can you commit that there will be some act to demonstrate that they will be held accountable in some way? And how do you do that without it looking like, yep, we'll just take out one by one, you can keep allowing more in? Well, again, I'm not going to telegraph punches that haven't been thrown yet um, or decisions that haven't been made yet. Um, we're going to stay vigilant to the threat. We've made it clear to the Taliban uh, that, uh, that we know what, what they did, and uh, we know who they harbored, uh, and we know some of the steps they tried to take after the strike to, to cover up the evidence of it. Um, so we're mindful of it. Um, but I'm not going to get ahead of decisions. Policy decisions that haven't been made. I mean, the, it's not that we take the Taliban at their word, but just indulge me for a second. They claim they want a relationship with the United States and with the West. They claim they want to open up um, and be part of the international community. They, they claim they want financing. That's exactly right, Peter. Um, so if that's true, if that's what they really want, uh, then it would behoove them to, to pay close attention to what we just did over the weekend um, and to meet their agreements under the Doha Agreement. Without identifying them, how many other al-Qaeda individuals or leaders do you assess are presently living in Afghanistan? I'm not going to get into intelligence matters, uh, Peter. We, we said even before we left Afghanistan last August that we knew al-Qaeda was, uh, was present in Afghanistan in relatively small numbers. Uh, and we know that there are still some al-Qaeda fighters in, in Afghanistan. I would, uh, again, without getting into... Uh, classified information here, I would say the number's not very large. And that's, al and that's core al-Qaeda. There are also offshoots like ISIS-K, which we know are very active in Afghanistan and, um, uh, right now. The, the other thing that I want to say, and I, I know rightly we're focused on Afghanistan, but again, I want you to take you back in time a little bit to about a year ago when we talked about this threat uh, and then our departure from Afghanistan. We know that al-Qaeda has metastasized, both in terms of character. Now they've got different offshoot groups, Al-Shabaab, ISIS, and ISIS has got splinter groups of its own. But they've also metastasized geographically. They're not 
focused as much in a presence in Afghanistan. They're in North Africa. They're in this, the Sahel. They're throughout the Middle East. And they're in Yemen. Uh, so, I mean, there's, uh, there are other uh, counterterrorism threats in other parts of the world. We're going to stay focused on them all. I get, I get that we're focused on Afghanistan right now, but we're not taking our eye off the rest of the world either. John, something you just said is not consistent with what we were told last year. You're saying that you've always known there was a small number of al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. President Biden said, what interest do we have in Afghanistan at this point with al-Qaeda gone? Yeah, I mean, in a major way, al-Qaeda was not playing a, no, wait, let me, let me finish. They weren't playing a major role uh, in, in operations uh, or resourcing or planning in Afghanistan. But Peter, I, I know specifically because I was at a different podium a year ago and we talked about the fact that al-Qaeda had a presence in Afghanistan, but small and not incredibly powerful or, or, uh, or potent. And I think, again, without getting into numbers, we would still assess that to, to be the case. So we know that the Taliban was harboring the world's most wanted terrorists. You guys gave a whole country to a bunch of people that are on the FBI most wanted list. What did you think was going to happen? I take issue with the premise that we gave a whole country to terrorist groups. I mean, again, I'd, 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 I'd encourage you to ask. The world's number one terrorist. How is that not giving a country to a, a terrorist sympathizing group, uh, if not giving them permission to have terrorists just well, sit on a balcony? The, the question, I mean, Peter, the way you asked that, it makes it sound like we owned Afghanistan a year ago. It wasn't our country. Um, it was an independent, sovereign state, and the president made a bold decision to end a war that had been going on for 20 years because he believed then and still believes now that our national security interests are best met by meeting the threats of today, not the threats of 2001. And uh, uh, we, you know, I don't want to relitigate the whole war here, but uh, obviously no one anticipated the Ghani government to fall as fast as it did. Um, but we said at the time that as we depart Afghanistan, we're going to keep vigilant.